All right. Well, my name is Rusty. I'm with Thunderbird Aviation, and uh, today we're here with another maintenance seminar. And um, today we're going to do the anatomy of an aircraft engine, and we are going to uh, be hosted by our director of maintenance here at Thunderbird, Paul Block. Uh, all right, Paul, take it away. Hey guys, thanks for showing up today. Um, I uh, one joke beforehand. Um, where does a mountain climber keep his airplane? That, that, that he's a he's a mountain climber pilot. Where does he keep his airplane? Anybody know where they would he would store his? Well, he keeps it in the cliffhanger. <laughs> All right, Corey Joel. I'm not pretty good at it, but <laughs> you got to start out on a beautiful, beautiful Saturday afternoon like this. So. Hey, since we didn't get any responses from that, uh, are you guys, can you guys all hear us okay and everything? Can somebody just chime in real quick and say yes or no? Yes. Perfect. All right. It just wasn't funny. It just wasn't funny. <laughs> now we can hear you great. No problem. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna briefly kind of go over the anatomy of an engine, but in that I, I want to tie it in with maintenance as far as uh, as an aircraft owner or pilot, um, just things to watch for a little bit, you know, things anomalies, different things like that. So we'll just briefly go over how how they're put together, and then maybe some of the strengths and maybe a few of the, the weaknesses that we, we find in an aircraft engine. Generally speaking, they're really bulletproof, but there are a few issues that happen once in a while. Probably not necessarily gonna take you out of the sky, um, but it, it is something to be watching for and then keep you safe so you would not have like an emergency landing somewhere. So the first thing we're gonna do is, uh, Mr. Chris, look at the board here, I got two, Two airplane engines sitting up here. One's a, a four-cylinder, one's a six-cylinder. This pretty much represents probably, you know, I would say 99% of, of the airplanes uh, and certified airplanes out here. And you notice uh, the way these are configured, uh, if you can understand what I got going on here, uh, you got an engine case, crankshaft area in here, propeller up on front, and then in the back area, we're going to have some type of accessory case or accessories in the back. These are representative, you know, crew drawing. I'm not a very good drawer. That's why we got props over here. Uh, these are the cylinders. Obviously, you can see this is a four cylinder. Now we got six of them here, six cylinder. And the orientation of most aircraft engines is what we consider horizontally opposed, a boxer style engine like the uh, VWs and, the, and a lot of the um, uh, Porsches and stuff like that, where the pistons are moving a, a counter counter uh, moving out against each other to keep the airframe uh, airframe balanced, uh, as opposed to what do we have in our what do we have in our uh, in our most automotive is some form of a V engine where the uh, pistons are moving up and down in a V V shape of some sort, ninety degree, sixty degree, depending, or just an inline where they're all just going up in one direction. So uh, here we're opposed. You know, one piston's going out that way, one piston's going out that way, one that way, that way, and they're kind of synced together to balance each other out. When one's one's going out, one's coming in, and it just balances the whole thing and 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 how they're tied into the crankshaft. So, um, just kind of to show you, we got I got my mock up here. Um, I will spin it around a little bit here. This one is actually got a constant speed propeller mock up on the front um, versus a fixed pitch, fixed pitch, but here it is. They're, you know, they're bolted up to a flange attached to the crankshaft. This is a direct drive, no gearbox. So you're actually, uh, and, and unless you have a gearbox, uh, most of the direct drive right to the, uh, right to the crankshaft. The propeller is mounted to the crankshaft flange. Um, and so here we see it right there. I can rotate the propeller around. And Rusty, if you can show them in there, you can see, we'll come over this, the bad cylinder. I wanted to show you what happens there. We can take a look and as we rotate it around, we can see the, the uh, journal lobes uh, moving around. And those are what, you know, the connecting rods are hooked to. You can see the one in blue on the backside, that's actually connected up. There's your crankshaft um, and there's the, the lobe on the crankshaft, and there's the connecting rod. Uh, 
And then if you look through on the other side, the cutaway, as that moves, you know, there we have the action of the piston moving up and down. Now, on most aircraft engines, uh, we're, we're geared. Everything's geared that, that, that moves um, uh, what we call the upper drive train or the valve train um, and all the accessories in the back. Most automotives were belt driven. You know, we have the serpentine belts, we have uh, the, um, uh, the uh, timing chain belt, which is a belt, not a chain anymore. And now in, in an aircraft engine, you see this is the accessory case. So in here we have, that's the, that's the direct gear off the crankshaft and that one is driving secondary gears. And if you look at this secondary gear here, uh, there's another little tang off of that, that drives your fuel pump, which is just a AC Delco uh, um, uh, uh, pump that just moves, it has an arm that moves up and down, you can see that. And it's just a lobe on a cam and that moves around and that's where you get your engine driven fuel pump on, uh, on most of them. And then if you look at these other accessory gears, they have some slots for them. And that would be for like driving mags right here or any other accessories. And then up here in green is the camshaft on this engine and it's located on the upper portion. And so that is timed with the uh, crankshaft to the position of the pistons. And what you'll normally see on most of these is external um, push rods. Here's a bent one. Here's one of what happens when you get a stuck belt. They bend and get stuck in there. That's uh, that's exciting. Here is here's, the, here's where we have the push rod tube housing right in here. This would be located right in here with some rubber seals. And then the push rod will be riding up in this area off the cam. Uh, and what it's gonna be riding on is hydraulic lifters such as these. Uh, they'd be up in there. They're, they're, they're hydraulically actuated here. Then they rub on this side against the cam. And as you can see, one of the things I wanted to talk about, and that is, uh, See the lifter? This is a small lifter. And this is what happens a lot of times with these engines, uh, corrosion, uh, moisture, different things like that that corrode that surface. Um, airplane's been sitting for a while or you know, winter, they, you don't get out flying as much and they, they start forming a little rust on that steel surface. The oil only lubricates for so long if it's been sitting. And then you go back up and start flying. Say, oh boy, I had to park it for about a year or so. And then a few uh, 25, 50 hours later, your mechanic goes, well, I found some, uh, some magnetic particles in your, your filter and in your screen. And you're like, uh-oh, not a good deal. And then we go and inspect at those, uh, those lifters and we see that and we're, we're bummed, we're, we're very bummed because that means you're gonna to have to split it and do a repair on there, change the cam out and change your lifters out. That usually requires splitting these two cave sounds, uh, which is the unfortunate part. Um, but anyways, back to how that works. Now you got your, your push rods, they'll go in there and they'll be you know two for each cylinder. Um, one's gonna be, if you look down here, we can probably look at this head right here. Here's the head. They're coming up like this through those tubes and then they're going to be opening up um let me grab my rocker arms uh, just, here they are yeah so your rocker arms pins and they're kind of tight Let's see if i can put this pin out there we go. your rocker arms are going to be sitting up right in that area there on that rocker uh, yeah. and then it'll come up and the rod will push down on the valve, open up the valve, right like that, there's a valve. The smaller one is the exhaust valve in this case, the large one's your intake. Open that up at the right time, close it, and you get your combustion, goes back out, pushes your piston back down, comes back up, 
Exhaust valve opens up, pushes the exhaust out. Piston starts to come back down again. Your intake valve opens up, draws the fuel air mixture in and shuts, then back up and you have your, uh, your fourth combustion, or your fourth uh, stroke, fourth stroke, and that is uh, where it compresses it and then ignites it with the, with the spark plugs on the top. So, and they're all actuated by external rods. Um, you'll see that in some of the motorcycle engines and some of the other ones. A lot of uh, automotive are all internal now or overhead cam type of situations, uh, but the old the old V8 350 is still internal where they're just encased in the case and not um, the engine block and not externally um, mounted. Um, uh, the reason they're sold, we do it this way on aircraft engines, these are really lightweight for what kind of power you get out of them. They're very, um, I mean, in general, you're getting close to a, a horsepower per pound, depending on, on size of the engine, you know? Um, this engine here doesn't weigh much over 200 pounds uh, as a core and puts out 200 horsepower. So, I mean, that, that's a pretty good, pretty good, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, what do you call power, ratio? Power to weight. Power, power <laughs> to weight ratio, yes. Now, the other thing you'll see too is, um, <clears throat> these things are bolted together you got bolts holding the case together. You got bolts that go all the way through the case. These are called through bolts. And you'll notice that's how the, how the cylinders are held on. They, they've tried many different ways of doing it. They've tried also uh, having bolts that run all the way through. Like if you look at the Boxster engine on like the, um, uh, the VW, the old VW bug, they actually bolt the head and the cylinder assemblies all together like this, snowmobiles, different things like that. They still do that all the way through. They tried it in aircraft engines, decided that did not work real well. So they came up with the steel cylinder and the aluminum head. And I'll, I'll show you, it's not always foolproof. If you look here carefully, you can see uh, these are threaded on. Now this is where can see those threads in there. You can just start to see the threads right down there. Now, this threading worked fine. Unfortunately, the casting on the head blew off. And uh, this was not a, not a good day. I mean, um, pilot landed safely and everything. Here's the head right here on it. Uh, so you can see there's, there's some of those, uh, you see some of the, the cylinder ADs, you'll talk about the ECI cylinder ADs and stuff that were, they're concerned about cracking. Well, this is what happens. It's a head separation to the barrel. I mean, you think about that head's holding all that pressure in, and that's a lot of, you know, when you have that, that power stroke, it's pushing really hard and wanting to push that head right out your, uh, right out your uh, cowling. Um, and so that's what we're talking about, that fracturing. And as you see, I mean, it's quite a bit of material. I mean, that's a pretty thick amount of material, but uh, they had some issues with the castings um, generally speaking, they don't unthread. Uh, if you go to a factory where they make these, it's just amazing how they got these machines that'll take the head and the barrels and probably heat them up, do something, and they just spin them together. And now you got one, one unit of two different metals, you know, aluminum and steel. And that's how they, how they go together. And this is what happens if you have uh, a fracture in one of those, which happens. It, it's, it's not uncommon, but it's not... Um, it's not prevalent. If you look at the amount of cylinders that pop their heads, uh, you know, it's, it's still pretty, uh, uh, they're, they're very, they're very robust. They take a lot of abuse. I mean, that's a lot of, a lot of uh, pressure in there. And that's still the best design uh, the aircraft manufacturers have ever come up with is screwing the head and the, and the, um, and the cylinder together. Um, here's an example of what connecting rod looks like very beefy. Um, you got to remember, I mean, you look at this compared to automotive and here's a piston, you know, generally this is an 0360 piston, which is also going to be the same piston in a 540. Um, you're just two more cylinders. So you think about this four cylinders in an 0360, that's like a 350 V8. That's a big amount of mass. These are big thumpers. We call them the big thumpers, low RPM, big power, you know? So you got to have a really beefy uh, connecting rod, um, and that's—I mean, this is 
Russ, there's some weight to that piston, isn't there? <laughs> there's some weight to it. There's some weight. It's, it's totally different than what we think of as racing and automotive and stuff. Lightweight, little teeny skirts and everything. These are big thumpers. I mean, thump, 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 thump at 2825 to 2700 RPM. Um, and this is a good beefy rod. I mean, they take a lot of abuse, but they, they build them. Uh, these things are strong. They'll last a long time. I mean... You can have a, a malfunction on one of these things, a the head can blow off, and these rods inspected again just seem to always come out just fine. I mean, rarely do you find something that's bent or broken on, on the rods. Rods are very bulletproof. Um, cranks are usually bulletproof. Sometimes they do crack and fracture, but I mean, for the most part, they're, um, they're very robust. Most of the time where we have a problem on crankshaft, and any at overhaul is uh, like, for instance, on this engine right here, we got a constant speed propeller. So if we take a look, uh, let me turn this around again. How does, how does that propeller and those pistons get their oil pressure? We look at it, see if I can fight against these springs. Oh boy, I can't quite do it. But, but this is, if you were to rotate, that's how the, uh, there you go. Rusty got it there. That's how they they move into their move their their uh, their pitch. You got a piston up here, and through the center of it is a shaft, a hollow shaft that hooks up right through the crankshaft, and it fills. There's this should be an O-ring in here, and it fills oil into this dome and moves that to back and forth in order to. There you go. So that dome fills up with oil. And how it gets there is if you look at right here on this engine, uh, right here, there's a port. This port is on most of the aircraft engines. This one's plugged right now, but if you were to open that up, bring a tube around, or sometimes they're mounted here in that opposite side, there's a plate there where a prop top governor goes. This one would be designed with the external tube going to a back accessory drive. You got your prop governor, your prop governor shoots extra oil into the crankshaft, hollow crankshaft uh, um, uh, journal. Uh, there's a bearing here, a bearing there with a space in between there with a hole in it. And it allows it to squirt oil into that center hollow space in that crankshaft, runs up through the seal and inside the prop, and then fills that, that dome up with oil. And that's where we get our movement from our constant speed propeller. And it's all governed by the oil pressure and the oil pump, basically, um, your prop governor is an oil pump. It takes engine oil and it, and it moves it uh, and pressurizes it into the crank uh, flange and, uh, and then moves the prop. And then uh, obviously all the fancy stuff going on inside that prop governor, when you set your, when you set your RPM, your condition, it basically has some fly weights and some springs. And those fly weights are gonna be either on speed or off speed. And if, it, if, you're, if, if things start to slow down, you know, the, the, the fly weights will change. And then it says, ah, I gotta, I gotta take some of the oil out or put some extra oil in in order to get the constant speed. So you keep that same RPM that you set on your, on your condition lever. Um, and, then, uh, and then obviously your throttle at this point is just manifold pressure. But that's just the, in a nutshell how most constant speed propellers work now that they're getting into electric ones and different things like that but for the most part this is your standard constant speed propeller you know an oil pump which we call the prop governor takes engine oil moves it into the crankshaft goes up there and moves a piston inside the prop and keeps that blade angle what we don't care what the blade angle is we just don't our condition says we want it at i set it at 2400 rpm it's going to hold it the best it can at 2400 RPM, as long as it's within the parameters, you know. So as you pitch up and climb, it's going to reduce some pitch and keep that up there. If you're going to dive down, it's going to increase the pitch and put more load on the propeller and do it all for you versus a fixed pitch where you're manually doing it with your throttle. Um, and uh, so that's how that that works. But getting back to the crankshaft, the big thing is a lot of these crankshafts are hollow in design, but they don't have a constant speed propeller on it. They have fixed pitch. So what they do is they tap a plug in there. And that plug basically traps a bunch of sludge, oil, and water in there. And an overhaul, you'll see it. Some people actually have, if they haven't 
had an inspection done, they might have to, your mechanic says, ah, oh, we got to do a, a check of the inner diameter of your crankshaft. And they pull that plug out there, clean it up and look for pitting in there. And what happens is that stuff gets kind of nasty and corrosive and sludgy. And then what it's done is it's, it's created some pits into the inner diameter of that crankshaft drill. This one, being a constant speed, is always getting oil flushed back and forth. So it usually keeps everything kind of fresh. Uh, the oil is getting um, um, uh, dried out, so to speak, uh, uh, because it's, it's been heated up by, by flying. And so it's always been some type of uh, engine driven oil going back and forth there versus something that's now trapped in there and sludging up with moisture and, and the possibility of rust and pitting. So that's one of the, one of the areas on, on inspection after overhaul, they have to pull those plugs. Um, some crankshafts are solid, very few of them, but a few of them are solid, um, like the Archer, uh, Archer A4M and A4A engines have a solid crank, it's just a solid, solid steel uh, crank in there. And obviously that type of engine will never be able to have a constant speed propeller unless it's electric and has some other way of, of, of doing it. So, so when we're talking about the anatomy of the engine, we got, you know, you see how we got the push rod tubes, so the rockers, the pistons, the connecting rods. Um, all right, so how does it get, uh, and, and just we'll show you on top of each, in the bottom of each cylinder is a spark plug. That's, you know, where it's gonna start the, uh, propagate the, uh, the flame inside. And we hook those up with, uh, uh, wire leads and then they go back and run to some type of magneto in the back of the engine. We saw the accessory case back there and these will plug into, you know, an opening like this right here and go into that gear right there. And with that timing and with the timing in here, it'll take the spark off the wire and go. And you see in this case, four cylinder, four wires. Then you're going to have one on this side, four cylinder, four wires. There's our our redundancy, we got two magnetos and four sets of wires for each one that are firing one top, one bottom, depending on which side it's on. So you have redundancy, if you lose it, you always have uh, at least one magneto and one spark plug firing, you know, and that's why we do our mag check and, and to make sure they're running properly. Um, drive gear, sometimes there'll be just like a, a fork type of drive inside there with a different gear. Um, and then in this case, which I like, these are the new electronic ones. Now, the only drawback to these are they're not self-energizing. They have to take ship's battery, power them up, and then they rotate with the timing. And then they send a very strong, very strong uh, uh, um, spark to the spark plug. But they're, they're powered off the ship's um, aircraft power system, battery system. So if you do lose lose energy, if you had an electrical fire and had to shut things down, they are wired directly to the battery. So as long as your battery still has some juice, even if you've lost your alternator, these things will work uh, down to eight volts all the way up to 32 volts. So they'll still fire at eight volts. So even though your 12 volt battery is starting to lose energy, it's still gonna fire. But I figure if you have an electrical problem and a situation, you still have your backup over there, you're probably not going to be worried too much about, is my one mag going to start crapping out on me? You're probably going to be landing somewhere and diverting. So um, that's why um, it's not that big of a concern. Um, in some aircraft that have a secondary battery system, uh, such as the Cirrus, you can put both of them in there because now you have battery backup. And they're also working on their own battery backup with the TCW battery system, which we're using for a lot of, of primary avionics. Uh, it's just a little small gel cell, like small motorcycle battery um, that is a backup to doing a dual system. So I think we're gonna start seeing more dual electronic mags. Nice thing about these, uh, 2,400 hours, you go bring them in and evaluate they're always producing the same spark from the first time you put them on there to 2,400 hours. Then you just bring them in, get them evaluated. They'll look at them, make sure all the circuitry and bearings and everything are good. Um, regular um, energized, self-energizing uh, magneto. There's 
most of the time four and five hundred hour inspections on these from the time you set them up because they're just a, a, a magnet and, and standard points and and plastic gears and things in there every time they spin they're they're going from um, a, a great state to their deteriorating the points start to close and open and and burn and so now the timing internally changes you don't have as hot of a spark so uh, you know as the time goes on there by the time you get to 500 hours you're glad to put the time in there and put new parts in there and, and re clean them up because they aren't performing very well you notice hard starting uh, higher mag drops and different things like that. So uh, these things start out great and then they just are always deteriorating. These things don't change throughout their life. It's electronic and it just sends a very constant uh, spark. So that's the one nice thing. These things are self-energizing. We've been running them on since tractors became. These all came from the tractor industry. Um, Bendex uh, scintillas were on most uh, 1930s and 40s tractors and that's what we, that's what we, uh, borrowed uh, from that technology. It's great. They are self-energized. You don't have to have ships, ships power to keep them running. But there are, as technology gets better, there are some drawbacks to that. Uh, they are all mechanical. And anytime you have something mechanical that's rotating, you've got to periodically um, inspect them. And plus, you also have some failures, too, um, where you don't have 500 hours and something breaks. Them. So that's, that's the uh, electrical portion of it. So then what's our next thing? We need a fuel source and an air source, okay? So if you take a look on the bottom of this engine, in this case, there's a pad right here. And look here, this actually looks like a bolt right up there. It's got these little tubes on there. It goes right through that. This is your oil pan. Now, on the bottom of the oil pan, you'll see another pad here. We'll call this an updraft uh, intake system where you're going to mount a carburetor or a fuel servo right onto that area there. Um, and if it's a carburetor, obviously at that point, they look about the same if you look at a carburetor and a fuel servo. The only difference is the carburetor has an area of fuel that's being stored here. It's in, in a bowl and a float system. Um, in a fuel servo, you will have a line that hooks up fuel to it and and another line going from that that goes up to the engine and top of the engine. And I don't have one with me, but it's a distribution block, which will actually, the air comes up through there. It, it checks the metering depending on what it, it needs. And it says, I'm gonna send so much fuel up through that other line, up the distributor block, and then inject it directly into the, uh, into the cylinders. And you'll see all cylinders will have an extra little port or uh, allow a little plug here. And this plug here can be taken out and you could have a little uh, fuel injector put in there with a line. Um, and so that's, that's the difference between our carburetor and fuel injection. You're mixing air and fuel going up these tubes in a carburetor. And thus, because there's air and fuel being mixed in here, this is our area where we would have our carburetor ice in that venturi. And um, without the presence of fuel and only air going in there, you can't have carburetor ice. So that's the, that's the benefit of the fuel injection. Still doing the same thing, it looks the same. It still has a throttle body and all these little passages. I don't want to, <laughs> accelerate pump, I don't want to squirt <laughs> rusty on that one. Um, but what it's doing is it's mixing it and sending it externally up to the cylinders versus mixing it together with the air and then bringing it up through the intakes. So um, very similar. Very similar design. It's just where it's it's uh, mixing the fuel. Fuels being, uh, you know, the the ratios are being done still by the the carburetor or the fuel servo, but then they're being mixed into the cylinder up either at the valves or through the intakes. So, and uh, benefit benefit on on the fuel injected is you can you can run a a, a finer. Um, uh, mixture and, and, and actually run meet a peak because you can adjust the system out. Hard to do that with a carbureted engine. And then number two, you get away from the carburetor ice issue. Um, but obviously are both, you know, very successful ways of, of distributing it. Very simple, not much going on. 
um, in, in this carburetor go wrong. They, they last a long time and don't give you too much trouble. Um, but they do have some anomalies where you all of a sudden you're like, huh, lost some power there. Well, you probably could have been picking up some carburetor ice and it happens. Uh, the FAA puts out a really good chart uh, and there's some days that are just off the chart and it's 75, 80 degrees out there, but the dew point and spread, it's just amazing. Um, that air going, air and fuel going through there can be cold and start building up and it doesn't go away right away. That's the problem. If you're close to the ground, you might be landing. So one thing to take a look at, look at the FAA's chart. They have a really good chart on carburetor ice. So, uh, so there we got those basic components right there. Um, so we got everything we got going on. So what are, what are some of the things? Uh, oh, here's something else. And these are starting to go away. So I wanted to show you, this is, a, this is a vacuum pump. You know, we have a lot of vacuum driven engines uh, or vacuum driven instruments. Now we're starting to get away from that. And we got the G5s, the 275s, and the Avidines and stuff. But this is basically what a dry air pump does. I just put a little glass thing over there. There's a little carbon block in there with some little veins moving around and then just an air pump driven off the uh, camshaft. So that's where you're getting those, uh, that's how your vacuum pump works. Um, just, a, just, a, just an air pump, just an air pump. Um, and you're using it in the opposite direction in, in a pump sense that your, your discharge is the air pressure you're getting out and the vacuum on the intake side is what's happening there. So, um, Rusty's getting some valves out. He knows I'm going to be talking about valves. So here's one of the things that that um, I wanted to bring up. Um, I, I briefly talked about the, the lifters and the cams, and I'll show you some cams there, and the valve train. Um, I wanted to talk about a chart here, and this is called anatomy of a valve failure. Um, and yes, I do see it. It's why we like the boroscope. Uh, cylinders and take a look at the valves. Um, I wish I had more valves to show you right now. Um, you know, and here is here is the burnt pizzas, and that is really what you see 99% of the time. You'll see kind of a, a a burgundy round, very circular pattern in there. I think the the the, the um, maroonish color, orangey color, comes from the probably the, the, the LEDs in the, in the fuels. I, I don't know what, what causes those colors, but I would assume that's what it would be, but they're very nicely circular and that's what we, we like. That's an even burning uh, valve. It means it's not leaking air around it uh, when it's in the closed position. So that's what you want to see. It's what you want to see. Burnt pizzas are what you want to see. Um, any type of circular motion. Now you start to see things where they're not so circular. You're, you're seeing patterns in there. And um, I'll show you one. This one's, eh, yeah, I would say that one's starting to look like this one. You know, it's just not really circular. You're not seeing that pizza. It's not really a lot of discoloration anywhere. It's just kind of yeah, pasty looking, you know, maybe it's getting to be a little like this where it's getting a little brighter on one side, but it's like, hmm, not so good, you know, it means that valve isn't seating properly. Um, and it's allowing uh, those exhaust gases to leak through it all the time. And that generates heat. You know, when we take think of, of EGTs, right, exhaust gas temperature, well, is it really your exhaust gas temperature? No. It's a specific amount of exhaust coming out at a certain time in pulses that, you know, you look at the propagation of, of the burning inside the cylinder, it's really hot. And so now when you think about that valve closing in that one, uh, that one exhaust port, um, it's an average of that hot air coming out, then, then it's closed. So this is, it's a constant cooling and, and, and heating of, of that air. So it's an average of the exhaust temperature. So what happens is when you start to leak a little bit, now that valve is actually, instead, instead of holding all that heat in the top of the head and, 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 and dissipating it out into the cylinder, it goes past this and it gets the valve really stinking hot in areas. 
And what will happen is it'll start to leak and you'll see those areas where they leak. It'll get hotter and hotter and hotter. They talk about the temperatures. Uh, I don't know if they do on this chart. Oh, here's the heat distribution. So you'll look at that, see how it's starting to burn really, really hot there. That's like 16, 1650 degrees. Now, you know, remember, you're never going to see EGTs that high because it's taking an average. But you got to remember, combustion is a lot hotter than an EGT. Always people say, well, I set my EGT at this. No, you're on, it's an average. It's just the ratio. It's, it's what's going on there of, of a valve opening up and you're measuring it down, down into, a, in, into a pipe. And, uh, but actual combustion temperatures, and this is showing that that's seeing, because it's leaking around there, it's actually getting really hot because it's passing through around that valve in that area and it's getting really hot. So what happens is, now look at this one. This is cool. I love this one. This one came from one of ours. Happens quickly too. Look at this. It's pretty, but not pretty if it was in your airplane engine. <laughs> we saw this one. We go do a we go do a hundred hour and go oof. Got some uh, got some valve leakage on there. So we pull out the borescope and go up oh, and pull that cylinder off. And if you were to really look at this, so this was getting really hot that green area and down in these areas there. If you were to really be able to carefully see on an inspection, you can see there's cracks starting. Crack, 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 crack from that, exactly what they said. What we get concerned about is now a chunk of that starts breaking off, gets into your engine, your valve can actually get sucked in past the, the, uh, the seat and it causes a lot of problems. So not good, not to mention, you're probably not gonna necessarily see uh, that much reduction in horsepower or anything, you're probably not going to notice it. And you're probably not even going to notice it's running. The only way you would see it, if you had an engine analysis, you'll see some anomalies in your, in your EGT or in your uh, JPI and your cylinder head temp and your EGTs and stuff like that. Other than that, you're not going to really be able to notice it. So that's, that's why it's really good. Uh, we need to inspect these things. And that's why we'll do compression checks and we'll do boroscoping and take a look at it. And the reason I want to tell you this is this happens quickly. And my, my concern is for, um, for uh, guys out there that, that fly a lot, that maybe it's not a bad idea to do some periodic checks in between um, uh, annuals. Um, I've had customers that fly 500 hours in a year. Well, we would have five annuals at Thunderbird because a hundred hour is basically an annual. And I'm not saying you get that extensive on it, but we, because of commercial flying, have to do these inspections. And, and the hundred hour inspection we do is the same as an annual. We can sign it off either way, depending on, on who's signing it off. Um, so the point being is previous hundred hour compressions were fine. Uh, next hundred hour, it looked like that. And we go, ooh, and this is eminent failure. It is. It would not make it to the next hundred dollars. This thing would be having big time issues. So, so what I'm saying is sometimes we got to take a look at things and it's not bad to think about your usage of your airplane and say, eh, you know, something just doesn't seem quite right, but let's, let's well, bring it to your mechanic or, or if you, if you have the ability to do it, take a look at it. We'll do a compression check on it. Do a little boroscope of it. Um, boroscopes nowadays you can get for your phone. And, and they do a good job. You just shut, pull out there and take a look yourself, you know, pull your, you can pull the plugs as a, as a, as a aircraft owner, go inside there and take a look with these little cheap horoscopes and you'll see stuff like this, you know, Ooh, I don't like this. And then you can talk to your mechanic about it. So that's the one thing it does happen quickly. Um, so just, you know, and it's nice if you have some of the, you know, uh, engine management systems. Uh, we don't have on a lot of our airplanes here. I don't have on my personal airplane. Um, sometimes the engine management systems are more of a hassle because, you know, sometimes the things are blinking on you and they're not, they're not the greatest, but they are pretty good. Uh, it's just that a lot of times people worry more about that and then they're concerned about flying. Um, but it gives you a baseline on it. Um, and you can see, 
you know, as long as you don't get crazy with, with how you're looking at, you know, oh boy, you know, I take off my AGTs get, or my CHTs get a little warm. Yeah, they will. And there's some of the, on the carbureted engines, you know, nothing you can do about it. I mean, they, a uh, nice warm day, they are going to be warm. You just lower your nose as soon as you can, pull back the power and cool them off. Um, and that's what I've seen. And, you know, some people get too concerned because, well, it says, you know, do this. And I'm like, yeah, I know. But what are you going to do about it? I mean, it, you not fly. <laughs> so uh, sometimes too much information isn't always the best either. But um, especially if you get too concerned, uh, I fly mine and, and we get a lot of hours out of our engines. I've, I've gotten 2,800 hours out of my previous engine and I didn't have an engine management system and I didn't burn any valves. So, I mean, it, and I'm sure they got hot at summertime when I was flying. Um, but I did look at the cylinders. I did boroscope them frequently, look at the valves. And I did have some valve issues where I saw some uneven patterns. And at that time I got them cleaned up and fixed. So, uh, so that's the thing on that. Maybe periodic checks if you fly more than uh, you know 100 hours in between annuals. That might not be a bad idea. Plus, are you cleaning your plugs? Plugs get pretty dirty at, at, in 100 hours, you know, especially with our lead fuels and stuff. Once they get rid of the low lead, low lead out of fuels and we go to an alternative, it will be better. Um, all the TBOs and engines will go up. Uh, the manufacturers already said with that new, with the new fuel that um, Gammy's talking about producing, uh, the performance numbers, the performance is better. And they're, the, the TBOs are gonna go up 30% because of the lack of lead in there. And we can use full synthetic fuels or uh, oils and have better lubrication. That's why they're saying the, the TBOs will go up. It's not as much impurities. Lead is not your friend for these engines. It's the only thing that we have to keep the detonation down and keep the performance number on the octane up there. Uh, but now with uh, chemicals, they can get that performance number way up into the you know upper 90s and 100s very easily. So, but that's that's coming down the road. But yeah, pretty valve there. But that's not good. We got to get that out of your engine. Okay. So now the next thing is that um, is also important is um, when we cut when we cut open the filters and take a look at the media, um, a lot of that stuff is pulverized, um, and you don't necessarily see a whole lot. You know, you can drag a magnet over there and see if it's any magnetic. It, magnetic is not a good sign. Um, it usually means one of two things. The steel parts, which are this and this, are wearing down and having a problem like this. These lobes worn down, running on that, that flaking that happens on these lifters and tappets. Uh, we are now seeing some engines that have roller tappets like the automotive industry, but not as much. We still have a lot of these, which are just the standard uh, surface, lubricated surface on there. Here's another, here's, here's one of the, these are the, uh, these are the design from the, um, these are actually Ford, Ford uh, lifters. They're not a tap because they got the lift, they got the hydraulic assembly in there. So we actually, the whole thing is a lifter. And these are the ones that'd be like in the uh, Lycoming uh, 0320 H2AD or the Seminole engines. Um, and very similar to the Continental engines have these, which are nice, Continental. These actually come out of the case and you can inspect them. These are trapped in there with the mushrooms, so you can't. You almost have to pull a cylinder in order to check that. So it's really, it's it's really kind of a, a a bugger to find out if you have this problem on these. These you can actually pull the the uh, push rod tubes out and take a look. Continentals are like that. Um, but what happens is you start to see something that's uh, you know, engines are always making metal. You know, there's there's it's just part of you know rings are going up and down in steel cylinders and things. So you're gonna see some metallic uh, particles in a filter. Um, it's the quantity and what it is. Um, some of it might be magnetic. I mean, if you had some rust uh, in your cylinder and you ran it up, the rings are gonna start tearing that. Nick, it's kind of more like a, a, a fibrous thin film in there. And yes, it will stick to your it will stick to your magnet, you know? And then some mechanics go, oh, 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 it's stuck to my magnet, it's all metal. Well, that can happen, but it's more of a fibrous thing when it's, when it's tearing up rust in a cylinder. If you, if you hadn't been flying for a while and you started up your engine, that rust in the cylinder is gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna get into your oil, into your filter. 
What we're more concerned about is, and this is the thing that I am really, um, is not as much as the filter, but as your oil screens. Right in here goes a screen. And what I have seen more so than anything of where I found problems is when you pull that screen out and you see little chips and flaky things that are not in a filter, that's the surface on these tabs that's flaking off that you got a problem there. That's not going to show up as readily in, uh, in the filter. Yes, when it starts wearing down the, the lobe little by little, those things will show up as small pulverized parts. But when it first starts to happen, flaking happens on here. And that's why at, at oil changes, at least every other one, but maybe if you, you know, if you don't fly that much, maybe every 50 hours, make sure you pull the screen and look. And if you find in the bottom of that, the cap on this is usually magnetic sometimes, depending on your engine, but you'll pull that out of there and you'll clean it out. And there, if you see any flaky stuff or any metallic particles, check those. And if they're bigger chunks like this, that's gonna show up as a little flake in there. Um, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean, oh, I haven't flown it for a while and it doesn't happen. I just put together two of our seminal engines and I said, it's just a bummer for me. Um, just put them together and we had um, tap at failure or, or hydraulic lifter failure. Ended up that um, sometimes you have to use reconditioned parts because you can't find them directly from the factory when we put these engines. And I got 16 of these lifters for these two engines from a manufacturer that reconditions them. And there must have been something wrong with their process of reconditioning. Um, and now I got to do a repair on these two engines at 100 hours because uh, engines were running great. But all of a sudden it's like, ooh, flaky stuff in the, in the, in the screens. And I'm like, that's not good. In this case, we didn't have to pull a cylinder. We just had to pull the tappets out and we found, um, let me show you. I'll go grab these real quick. I'll show you three of them that came out of one engine. Um, Here's one, it's fine. So if you only looked at that one, you say, oh, everything's good. Everything looks pretty good. Here's one in the early stages of flaking. And here's one in later stages of flaking. And that all happened within, well, we didn't see anything in the first oil changes from opening up, but that in the last, between the last 50 hour and 100 hours. So within 50 hours, this is what had, took place. Um, you know, which is very disheartening for me in this case. Um, I'm going to see if, I don't know if I'll get anything back out of the, manu the manufacturer who, who reconditioned those, but I'm going to see if I can find brand new live combing ones this time um, um, uh, and see if they're available at this time. I've heard that they are producing them again. It's so one of the problems we have right now is production of parts. So sometimes you might have to use reconditioning if you're going to keep your airplane together. Um, uh, I usually like to use on some of those rotating parts, new tappets and lifters, not reconditioned cranks. I mean, it's acceptable to recondition cranks. It's acceptable to recondition lifters. But to me, I don't like taking the risk. Doesn't mean a brand new one off the shelf is going to have a problem. But I just, I just feel more comfortable with it. Just saying it. I'm using the best I can in there. Um, but um, oh, those, are things that, those are things that happen. So that's why just looking at a filter isn't always the case. I wouldn't have caught that on the filter. You didn't see much of anything in the filter. The, the cam hadn't worn down yet because of that roughness. Um, there's a little, little bit of particles in there, but it was, the filters were really clean, but the screen had stuff in it. So um, that's why, you know, as, uh, as aircraft owners and stuff, pull, you know, make sure that screen gets inspected also. Um, it, gives you good information. We had a customer here who was annual in their engine. Fil uh, filters look great. Well, there wasn't much time on it. It's been sitting around. We pulled the screen, found a big chunk of, big chunk of metal in there, brought it over to uh, the engine place. And he goes, ah, I'm overhauling one of these engines. One of the uh, journal supports, one of the, 
uh, this would be a journal, uh, crankshaft journal support, one of these areas inside the engine where it actually cradles the, the crank journal um, on, on a continental engine. He said, ah, we just overhauled one and we had flaking. He said, that's a chunk of that journal flaking away. He said, that engine's gotta be repaired, taken down. Um, and if we hadn't gone and checked that screen, um, you know, it could be a problem. And so, I mean, it's not great news, but you know, the idea of what you don't know does sometimes affect you. And uh, it's also yeah. better to catch that stuff early. It, or better to catch it early. You do a lot more damage. I mean, yeah, it's 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 a bummer, but you know, the idea is we're here to be safe, not just shove things under the rug. So um, these things tell you. And the other good thing is they're bulletproof. If something happens in between something, you're usually in, in really good shape. I don't want to scare people into thinking, oh, your engine's going to fall out of the sky. These things really do work well. Um, all these things, people got down safely. The head blowing off, uh, that cam, um, this piston. This piston is off, off one of my friend's pistons on an engine he had out in Nebraska. This thing got them. They had to do emergency at another airport, but this thing was coming apart but it still ran well enough that they made it. Now they were in Nebraska, which is pretty flat. <laughs> you know, in the mountains would be totally different, but my goodness, that thing was, and, and then I think one of these cams was what, was what probably started causing some of the problems where it, uh, the piston pin got stuck and it, it had some issues. And unfortunately, I think the person doing their maintenance at the time had seen it lost oil pressure a few times and cleaned out some particles of stuff. And that's usually something telling you that I think what was going on was one of the lifters was going on, got stuck in the oil pressure relief, which is this part of the engine right here. It's a ball, it's just basically a ball and a spring. I don't think I can open that one up and show you. Um, yeah, maybe I can. I don't know if it's in there right now. We'll find out, I don't know. Yep, there it is. There's the spring, there's the ball. So this is your oil, oil, oil relief valve. So this spring on this ball goes into a little socket in there. It's just a little socket that the ball rides on with spring pressure. And as the engine oil pressure gets up to you know, 80, 90 PSI, it starts allowing this, pushing the spring back and allowing some of the pressure to bypass the pump and go back to the sump. And that's what regulates it. Well, when somebody says a problem, all of a sudden it, they have their oil pressure kind of dumps on them. It's usually something on this ball not seating properly. And then I pulled them out and seen little chunks of things. Well, just think of one of those flakes made past the screen and got underneath there. You could have some bad oil pressure, not necessarily, sometimes it's carbon, not necessarily something that's bad if you, if you have some unstable oil pressure, it happens at times. Uh, but um, when it starts to, get really bad. And this was the case. They had done some work on this engine. And a few months later, they, well, we cleaned this, that out. And then this thing just seemed like it had some problems. And then he calls me up and says, oh boy, it landed in uh, Grand Island, uh, Nebraska. And he had me go out there and I took a look at it. And I go, oh, there's a ton of metal all over in there. This is not good. And uh, so anyways, um, but it got, got everybody there safely. I mean, it wasn't, so these things are bulletproof um, and they'll get you there, but you know, we still want to keep them in as good a shape and, and look at the signs. That's the only thing I can say. Um, see anything else on anatomy? Talked about electrical system, air fuel mixing, um, combustion, um, any problems that I see. Like I said, tappets and uh, tappets, carburetor ice and uh, Valves are pretty much the thing you just kind of want to keep an eye on. Um, um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, we have one question already in the chat. If you guys have a question, go ahead and throw it in the chat. Or uh, once we're done with the chat ones, you can unmute and ask it uh, over your uh, device. Let's see. Uh, we had one question from Walter. I substantially lean the engine during taxi, barely above roughness or even with a small bit of roughness. My theory is that it helps save fuel and burn out carbon that accumulates in the full rich operations. 
during many phases of flight? Am I hurting the engine by having a substantially lean mixture during taxi? No, as long as it's running, it's fine. Is it a carbureted engine? Yes. Yeah, no. I mean, you're not, I mean, it's not going to get, you're at low RPMs. It, it's just, you know, um, th there's, there's no problem with that. Run, here's the thing. These things that, these, especially the carbureted, they run fat for the most part, especially at lower, uh, when you're full rich on it, you're dumping a lot of fuel into that uh, system. And here, here's, here's what I would take a look at. As you're sitting there idling, say you're about 800 RPM, pull your mixture back and see how, what, your, what, your, what your rise is on RPM. And I bet you'll see that it's quite, quite high. And what I would like to see you taxi at is, is as you're taxiing along, I always like to lean to peak RPM. You're very safe in there. At peak RPM, you're probably on the rich side if you were at, at like a full power takeoff or a, or a cruise takeoff, 100 degrees uh, rich of peak. Now, it, it all depends, you know, obviously you're not gonna be at any peak anything at, at an idle, but just, you know, when you, when you pull back, when you pull back and you're at, at, um, at peak RPM, you're always safe on those engines. You're not going to hurt anything. Um, and, and likewise, I mean, sometimes at a high density altitude, uh, people are out here taking off 5,000 and they're full rich. Well, that's what it says to cool the engine off. I'm like, yeah, but what your airplane thinks it's at 5,000 feet. What's your performance on this field? You can end up with the trees. So sometimes there again, look at summer operations. Uh, it's a draw. It, it's a, it's a, it's a it's it's a, you have to weigh the things. Are you going to just run full full rich because well that's what my instructor told me to do, and then have trouble clearing the trees because you're not making power. Look back at, at what you're doing. You can you can for short periods of time and take off and clearing the trees. I would rather be making more power than going full full rich on on something. Um, so you just got you got to be careful about this. So a lot of times, I, you know, I'll I'll lean it back a little bit and get at least peak RPM on the end of the runway, so um, I'm not super fat because these things are not gonna density altitude's five thousand feet. <laughs> Boy, that's a lot of these carbureted and small engines are gonna be like, ah, I'm having trouble get climbing out. So right, Paul, yeah, that's just definitely just something to think about. You're you're generally not gonna hurt something as long as you don't go way, 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 way lean a peak. And, and most carbureted engines are not going to run way, way, way lean a peak. Okay. The only time people are going to have troubles is like on a fuel injected engine where it's a little bit more stable all the way across and, and, and you got, you know, and they're running, you know, um, but there usually they have an engine monitoring system and they can run uh, lean a peak and stuff. Um, so. Okay. Hey, quick follow-up question for you, if I may. Yep. It's so the tack, the airplane that I routinely fly, the, the tack, it very barely shows a rise when I'm leaning and I'm looking at the mixture knob and it's way out, right? So what I'm doing is with reference to what it feels like, the plane even shakes a little bit and and certainly the noise that I'm hearing. And so when I'm taxiing, it's it's like there's just a little tiny bit of shake and vibration. And I can definitely hear that the engine isn't sort of hitting on all cylinders because it's that lean. Yeah, and I'm not seeing I'm not seeing a, a, a rise in the tack that's that discernible. So I'm using yeah. my ear and I'm using the seat of the pants. Is that OK? I, I probably when it, if it's if it's running that rough, I probably would back off a little bit. But um, um, you're probably really you might have an intake leak on one of those uh, one of those cylinders. So so if you if you got unmetered air, you know, and that's that's something to think. Um, if you got one that's kind of really misfiring, you could be way out of uh, way out of parameters on one cylinder, and that's something to think about um, in general in the leaning position because that's one cylinder usually is the problem. Okay. And when if you don't have an engine monitoring system that's looking at each EGT, um, and so when it's rough, it's it's beyond stoichiometric. Uh, which is being able to sustain combustion properly. If you feel that roughness, it's kind of it's kind of misfiring, and it sometimes that leanness could be a, a detonation. Now, at a low RPM, I'm not as concerned about it, um, mm -hmm. but I mean, I probably wouldn't go that far. And then, okay. yeah. 
Great. Yeah. great. Hey, this is a great presentation, by the way. Thank you very much for this. Well, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Does anybody else have any other questions they want to put in the chat or uh, ask over the uh, over Zoom? All right, not seeing anything come through. And I and I wanted I, I want to bring a presentation out here. I don't want to scare you guys. I, I just want people to be aware and be safe. Um, these things are safe, but don't ignore some of the signs at times. And that and 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 be looking for some of the signs so you don't get yourself into a situation where you you know um, where you where you suck in a valve. Um, you know, I, people say, Hey, I sucked in a valve. Well, it's because if you caught it earlier, like that one that I have on my table, it wouldn't have been an anomaly where it scares and you get the pucker factor, you know, you catch, you try to catch these things before they happen. And that's why I'm trying to just be watching, be, be, um, you guys are going to know your airplane engines more than us mechanics. Cause these are all have little subtleties on everything. And I know my airplane a lot better than I would some other mechanic. And, and the same thing as I always tell the pilots, I said, you know, when something doesn't feel right, you know it more than I didn't notice it. I didn't notice it. It seems pretty good to me because they're all, all a little bit different. Oh, something's just not right. And then we keep on looking until we find out that maybe there was an issue to look at. So uh, not to scare you, but just to keep you safe. And uh, thanks for coming out today. Uh, I do have uh, one question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I recently took a um, instructional flight in a uh, light sport aircraft, Pipistrol Alpha Trainer, and the instructor said that uh, it can take either MO gas or AV gas. Uh, I believe he said there's not much difference in performance, and I think he even said you could mix the two. Do you have, in that kind of situation, do you have any preference as far as using MO gas versus AV gas? Well, first of all, uh, in the MO gas, what are they doing for MO gas? Um, uh, yeah, uh, never, 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 never is any of the mole gases. If they're, if they're at an airport, it's very stable. If you're going down the bills uh, or one of these other gas stations around here, make sure that, it, that it's on the Hot Rod Association's approved list of, uh, of non-oxy gas. Um, so that's the one thing I've, I've seen. And, and a lot of the National Hot Rod Association is very good about testing fuels around the cities and saying, hey, you know what? Those guys lie. Uh, you don't want ethanol in that, number one. It's bad for, for everything in anything. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, even in your lawnmower equipment, don't leave, you know, don't use ethanated gas. Use non-oxy. Uh, but the other thing is you got to remember that you're lowering the performance number of that fuel. Uh, when you're blending it, it's it's a little bit better. It's somewhere between that, but say most non-oxy is 91, 92 octane. Your airplane engine will run down to 87 octane. But you gotta remember back to the carburetor ice, carburetor ice, and and it, it the lower octanes do tend to build up carburetor ice easier. Um, the other thing you have to also look at is uh, detonation. Um, lower per performance numbers. These things. These, these big thumpers are detonators. They're always kind of in a detonating characteristic. And so at high power settings and you start leaning them with a lower performance number now, you have more of a chance for that. You hear a little, and once in a while you hear them knocking and detonating, they do do that. Um, and so that's the other thing I'd be a little more concerned about. Um, now when they're approved, it's, it's the lower compression engines and stuff, but be careful, be careful what you're putting in there. Make sure it is approved. If you looked at most of the STCs, they specify um, a manufacturer grade of, you know, from like the Coke refinery. It's just as, as it's gotta come from a certain place. Now, most people say, well, I just go over to the gas station and get the non-oxy. Make sure that that non-oxy really is non-oxy and, and it's good. Um, because there are some gas stations that say they got non-oxy and they've tested it and then all right, uh, National Hot Rod guys go, don't go there. So be careful, don't put ethanol in there. So, um, and right now, to be honest with you, I don't see the, I don't see the savings. The non-oxy right now, <laughs> I, it was about six bucks a gallon and it's about six bucks a gallon out here. I'd rather use the ab gas. Um, 
It has a higher, a longer shelf life on it. Avgas has to be stable for three years. Uh, Non-oxy, you know, it's better than the stuff with ethanol in it, but I'd say six months out of it, it starts to smell a little turpentine. -y. Um, it doesn't have to have the same shelf life, but by the manufacturer standards, aviation gas has to have at least a shelf life of three years. And I've seen it a lot older than that and it's never been a problem. So uh, anyways, food for thought. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I like to talk about uh, cold shock in an engine. Uh, during break-in, we're told not to cold shock an engine. What goes on in the anatomy of the engine that's caused by cold shock? Okay, take a look at take a look at what we had here. What kind of materials we have in here? You got steel. You got the head portion here is aluminum. You got a piston that's aluminum. And what you're doing is uh, uh, the steel is going to maintain heat longer than the aluminum is going to dissipate it quicker. Okay. And so what happens is, and, and, and the thing is, you're not going to you're not, you know, when it's when it's warmer out and you still got to be careful about it. But as these pistons go up into the into the cylinders, most of them are are called choke. And what choke is, you know, let, let me let me get a diagram here. This is gonna be a crude diagram, but it shows what we're talking about. Um, so here's our cylinder head, kind of crude. Here's our barrel right here with our flange and our pistons inside there going up and down into this area, right? So what choke is, this is, I, I use a different pen, that one's not going so good. Choke, this is now, remember this is crude, this is thousands, not, not big inches. <laughs> I'm drawing this crude. Here's your cylinder now, here's the head. So barrel choke is the tapering of that cylinder going up, okay? Tighter as it gets up to the where you're gonna actually have the expansion and combustion up top here. So as that piston goes up in there, it's getting tighter as it goes up into this area. Now, obviously that's not gonna fit, but now think about this in, in thousands, of, thousands of clearance here versus thousands of clearance there, that's choke. So as you, as you cool things off and they shrink and expand at different rates, uh, things might get tighter, extremely tighter. And when, when you shock cool, you're getting up there and that piston goes up and it can just cause problems and really be too tight. And now the piston itself and, and yeah, and you can blow the head off too. So that's, that's what you're, you want even temperature cooling as much as you can, you know? Um, and so that, that's the idea of shock cooling is keeping these metals dissipating their, their heat energy, not rapidly, but relatively slowly. And, and, and the way to do that is reduce power slowlier, you know? Don't come in there and chop and drop in the middle of winter. You know, you got your cylinder head temp at 400 degrees and think about that combustion in there. And now all of a sudden you chop and drop these engines being air cooled, they're not water cooled anymore. They're air cooled. You don't have that water jacket of warm tempered air like you do, or warm te uh, uh, t uh, temperate water like you do in your car engine. Now you pull it back, and all of a sudden these things, that heat heat signature just starts to go away, and it's evenly going away where these things can fit together. You don't want that piston to come and slide up in there and go, I'm stuck. And that's one of the nice parts about having cylinder head temperature readings. Yeah, yeah. I've seen just coming in from 3,000 feet down to traffic pattern altitude, I've seen cylinder yeah. heads drop 100 degrees. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So the idea is when you think there's going to be, uh, uh, and especially on a newer engine too, where, where the tolerances are, are tighter, uh, you, you just want to step down your power settings. You know, just don't chop and drop. And that's why we say in break-in phase, we don't allow chop and drop. We don't allow it. We, we fly for 25 hours prior cross country because I don't want the, you know, what is, what is the, our training? <laughs> we Pattern. beat up on these things. <laughs> Pattern work. All right. You lost your engine, chop and drop that hot engine, screaming along, 
you just launch your engine, boom, where, pick the farm field, where, where are you going to go, you know? So that, that's, what, that's what we're talking about, shock cooling. Those parts don't want to go together when they cool down at different, you know, all, you know. Um, for instance, just giving you a little quick one on metallurgy. Just a quick one and then we'll get going here. Um, this is a ring gear that goes on the, the front of your, uh, your uh, ring gear supporter, what we call almost like a flywheel type of thing. This is where your starter ring gear goes on. And I had a gentleman the other day go, well, I'm trying to pound one of these things on. And I'm like, no, they don't pound on. What you do is, and it's amazing, the first time I did this, you got your ring gear support, flip it upside down, um, or actually set that offside, put that in the, the freezer, set this on some blocks, and I take a huge uh, acetylene torch and I start to heat this thing up. You know, I have it on blocks, it's sitting there, it's just glowing. Bring the thing out of the refrigerator, drop it on there, clamp it. Whoop, that's how it is. It's a, it's it's a it's a fit tight. In this case, we want that cold temperature uh, uh, and tight fit, and that's what holds these rings on. It's amazing. It's just it's just a temperature fit. Tight expands when it's warm, and then it contracts. Now you don't want that to happen and seize inside your piston. So that's that's the idea of cold shock. So. All right, it looks like we do have one more question here, Paul. Uh, is it common to have engine instrumentation calibrated while in service? My engine runs cool both in uh, cylinder head temperatures and exhaust gas temperatures. The instrument is an older unit that does not log the data from the flight to flight, but does indicate each cylinder for both CHT and EGT. Seems to be consistent over time with CGTs ranging between the high 200s and about 315 for the highest one, but usually three of the four are 285 to 295 and the EGTs in the higher 1100s. So I guess the main question, is it common to have engine instrumentation calibrated while in service? It could, um, I don't know. It depends on what the calibration is for it. First of all, that engine management system is probably not, it's secondary to uh, is, is this part of the airframe manufacturer? Is it illegal calibrated? I mean, is it, is it from the manufacturer? So aftermarket, is it aftermarket? Uh, most at, aftermarket are, are, are not primary instrumentation unless in the JPIs, if you get into the 900 series and above, they are, um, some of the, uh, electronics international, the EI systems are, but what do you have for your instrumentation in your- it says it's an old GEM. Don't know much about that one, yeah. So um, if you want, but what does it mean? It's giving you some information and everything is baseline. Um, there's not, there, as far as EGTs, there really isn't anything that says it's too high, the number reads high. It's just what you're looking for is, is where they peak out and where they come back down. You know, uh, cylinder head temps, um, not required, you know, so you're looking at it. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm assuming that your cylinder head temps are not going drastic because you're not melting the head off. So it's up to you whether or not you think that it's running higher than, than those temperatures, you know, low compression engines might not go that high, you know, so it all depends. And what, what, what are you flying in that? I mean, is it, high power settings that take off in warm summer and they're still at 315. Um, it seems like you're probably a little rich and not making full power, I don't know, um, you know. All righty, does anybody else have any additional questions or anything? All right, we're going to go ahead and sign off. We appreciate everybody joining in. This was a little bit of a long one, but very informative. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys on the next one that we do. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Yep, thanks.